Looking good. The 24th of August, 1972. An evening in late summer. It's almost the end of the school holidays. One of those days when it felt like England was about to choke on its own nostalgia. Nostalgia for the war years, for the finest hours, while we, the teenagers, were screaming inside for something, anything to happen. And music was where we were looking for signs of life. David Bowie and the Spiders had made their debut earlier in the year. Queens was just around the corner. <clears throat> It was into this atmosphere that Roxy Music dropped their pop culture bomb on the British public, performing their first single, Virginia Plain, on primetime BBC One television. The sound was a shock to the system. A psychedelic Sinatra crooning pop art poetry over driving drums, over saxophones and oboes heavily treated electric guitars, and the most out there synthesizer parts you'd ever heard. The musicians themselves were dressed outrageously, each one with an individual, well-defined look. Put it all together, and what you got was pulp science fiction. Mm. Mm. Their wildly exciting self-titled debut album, thank you, was just as cinematic. It took the listener to burnt out battlefields, sunlit beaches, and darkened movie theaters. There was funk, country and western, rock and roll, German experimental music, doo-wop, all hybridized into something entirely new. But this was more than just music. This was all-encompassing, pioneer, lifestyle branding. This was an entire genre unto itself. This was Roxy Music. Uh, Nick Rhodes, Nick, our bandmate Nick Rhodes and I went to see Roxy in 1974 when they came to Birmingham. I was 14. On a Saturday afternoon, we found ourselves in the lobby of the Odeon, where we made the acquaintance of two fans they told us that if we hurried down the alley alongside the building, we could hear them rehearsing. This is where I learned about the secret world of the sound check. There were a dozen kids standing around, all wearing Roxy t-shirts and scarves. We listened as they warmed up on songs from their latest album, Country Life. Suddenly the music stopped and on cue, a black Mercedes rolled up to the backstage door. I'd never seen a black Mercedes in my life. I would see a lot of them. In a sudden frenzy of activity, the band rushed out into the light and piled into the car, which took off at speed. A girl shouted, they're staying at the Holiday Inn. Wasn't it more like, they're staying at the Holiday Inn? Yes. It's the Brummy accent, yeah. So off we ran at full pelt across Birmingham city center. When the car pulled up at the hotel entrance, we were already there. I remember thinking, Phil Manzanera, was the tallest person I had ever seen. Well, knowing him now, it must have been the platform boots. <laughs> At the show that evening, I recorded Roxy on my portable cassette player. You could do that back then. And the next night, in my darkened suburban bedroom, I listened back and realized what I wanted to be. I knew my destiny. The subsequent journey of Roxy Music, piloted by the open heart surgery that was Brian Ferry's lyric writing, would take us deep into emotion and romanticism. As listeners, this was not what we'd expected. We came to party, but what we learned was to feel. Over a 12-year span, they recorded eight studio albums, each one a masterwork, each one filled with moments that defy the dry eye, always the experimentation, the drive, 
the humor, the articulate, versatile musicality, a body of work that fulfilled every promise of the electric rock era. After leaving the group in 1973, Brian Eno would become the world's most innovative studio musician. <clears throat> a one-man zeitgeist. Eno helped shape some of the most significant artists of our time. He also has the distinction of being the musician most frequently cited as an answer to clues in the New York Times crossword. <laughs> musician Brian, three letters. <laughs> musician Brian, three letters. Easy. I already said that. <laughs> Eno, Eno once said of the Velvet Underground, they didn't sell many records, but everyone who bought one formed a band. Roxy sold many more records than the Velvet Underground, and they influenced the life choices of everyone who came into contact with them. The name Brian Ferry has become a, a synonym for cool. He is, like Cary Grant, another Englishman whose phenomenal drive and determination lay behind an image that was made to look so effortless. Aspirational, but strongly grounded in his working class roots, Brian is one of the most restless spirits in 20th century art. In his memoir, Niall Rogers wrote that after seeing Roxy in London, he tapped into what he called the deep hidden meaning that would fuel the concept for his own band, Cheek. The Sex Pistols. The Sex Pistols were also heavily influenced by Roxy. So indirectly, they helped to ignite the punk rock revolution. And of course, I'm always proud to say that without Roxy music, there really would be no Duran Duran. For sure. Sad but true. Along the way, in the early 80s, we were inadvertently able to introduce Roxy to our young American audience. When radio stations like WLIR would play, yeah. Yeah, would play both bands back to back. <clears throat> our musical paths finally crossed in 1985, when Nick and I invited Andy Mackay to perform with us on Arcadia's So Red the Rose. <clears throat> Andy's unique style of playing saxophone and clarinet proved to be the crucially lush element that we were looking for. Roxy Music's influence is immense and impossible to calculate. We are happy to see them here together tonight and honored to be the ones to bring them into this hallowed institution. Ladies and gentlemen, it is our pleasure to induct into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, Roxy Music!